Good to be at church, isn't it? You think about it. I love that song we just sang. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. It's not Jesus. I started thinking. I've been to Russia. Man, I don't speak Russian. I remember before we went, my wife had these little stickers of whatever it was called in Russian, and it's like, yeah, whatever. I lived in Germany. I know Sprechen Sie Deutsch. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to say I don't speak your language in a lot of languages. But you know the one language I do speak? I speak Jesus. And I want that's, I mean, we all need to be about speaking Jesus wherever we are. Because our God is all-powerful, all-knowing. He's awesome. Well, we're in the book of Acts. I've been there last week and this week, and we're going to be there in the coming weeks till God says, get out. Amen? This was one of my favorite books, is the, uh, the book of Acts. And as we, th- we see it, we see the early church and, and how it got birthed and came alive. And we're sitting here today because of the early church. Amen? But there's some lessons that we can learn in the er- from the early church. You know, you think about it, a lot of times we want to, uh, we want to change everything. We want to modernize everything. But the reality of it is there are some things that uh, maybe old teachings or there's some things that, that from the past, you know what, they still apply today, amen, as we think about it, you know. Uh, and so hopefully as we've been going through this series, it, it's going it's to challenge you uh, in your walk with God. Uh, I, I hope these messages as, we, uh, as we're looking at the gospel in motion um, put us just there, in motion, and I hope they put us in a place of... Uh, out of our comfort zone. I hope that we, we you know, as Pastor J.W. and I preach, I hope we put you on the, heart, the hot seat, uh, you know, just because we don't like you, you know. No, 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 that's not it. Because we need to be on the hot seat for the Lord Jesus Christ as we think about it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, this morning, speak to our minds and hearts. I know we're just two weeks into this study, Father, but Lord God, I anticipate great things, Lord, not because we're great people, but because you're a great God. You're an awesome God. You're a powerful God. You know everything, Father, past, present, future. And Lord, you are our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, be with us as we continue to move forward, Lord. Help us to, if you will, pick up some gospel momentum as we continue to move forward, Father. Because we got a, we got a neighborhood, we got a community, we got a city that needs us on mission for you, Lord Jesus. So be with us this morning, Heavenly Father. Again, Lord, we thank you for Christ and it's in his precious name. Amen. So we continue our, our, our study through the book of Acts this morning. The book of Acts is really a, a story of, the gospel, of gospel momentum. Because you look at what happened here, and it spread. It spread like a wildfire, if you will. And so it, it cultivated gospel momentum. Uh, it's building on gospel, gospel momentum, and it's maintaining it. And guess what? We are here today because of what happened there. And where is it going to go? You know, we get to the book at the end of the book of Acts, and it stops. But it doesn't stop. You know why? Because we're still writing chapters in the book of Acts for what's happening here and now for you and I. And so hopefully our chapter is, is looking good, that we're on fire for Christ, that we're reaching people for the Lord, that we're making a difference in people's lives. Question. Are we a church and are we a people it's all about the gospel momentum, about keeping that momentum flowing and keeping it going. We, what better textbook than the Bible, and especially this book of Acts, what better curriculum do we have to see how the church did it? You know, it's spelled out there, and I believe it's spelled out there, and this momentum can keep going. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure we can improve upon the Word of God. Amen? There's a story about a long time ago I heard about Billy Graham. He was coming to a, a large city to, to do one of his crusades, uh, and uh, you, know, you know, Billy Graham even had his critics. I mean, it's hard to believe, but he did. Uh, but there were people who they didn't like the, what he said and the way he said it, and some of the critics were saying, if Billy Graham comes here to do a crusade in our city, he's going to set missions back 50 years. Well, pa- Billy Graham heard about it, and he said, look, I don't want to set, set missions back 50 years. I want to set it back a couple thousand years to when God started it. Amen, as we think about it. Well, that's exactly what the book of Acts is. You know, you think about it. There are the disciples, those that were following Jesus. 
He gets crucified. He's dead. He's resurrected. Like, okay, things are getting a little bit better. He takes off. And all of a sudden, it's like they're, they're, they're alone again by themselves. What are you going to do? I mean, is, is the one that you're looking to, is the one that you're following all of a sudden gone? Ah, but God knew exactly what he needed to do, didn't he? Because the story doesn't end there. No, it doesn't. If the church and the body of Christ is to have a future, if Pierce Park is to send a spiritual shockwave through the Treasure Valley, I believe we can learn some lessons out of the scriptures this morning that show us how we can do just that. You know, as we talk about the early church. And so keep in mind, there's some things in here, you know. I want us to go back to Jerusalem for a second. The coming of the Holy Spirit came upon the church and God used this small group of men to light the world on fire for the gospel. There's some great stories in there that there was thousands that were added to the day, to the church daily. God was on fire. We worship the same God, amen? How come? I read a thing yesterday morning that said the Southern Baptist Convention has lost 1,263 churches since 2022. Over 1,200 churches. Shut the door. Why? There, if you go and read studies about pastors, there are pastors who are leading, leaving the ministry in droves. Why? we got the power of God on our hands. It says so in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive power. We are powered up. Okay? Because we're plugged in. Plugged in. It's like you have a fight. I left my phone down there this morning. You know? And I've said this before. Your phone becomes a paperweight if you haven't, don't keep it charged up. Right? Well, we got a God that is charged up, and hopefully we're charged up. And so if you open your Bibles up this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 1, we're going to pick up in verse 12. We're going to look at some verses. And so, verse 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem. I'm in Acts chapter 1, verse 12. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they arrived, they went to the, to the room upstairs where they had stayed. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, uh, Simon, Judas. They all were continually united in prayer. All continually united in prayer. All continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now we see the 12, that, you know, they'd walk to Sabbath day, only about a mile and a half. They went back to the upper room, most likely the place where they had served and shared a meal with Jesus when he, they, uh, the night he was betrayed. They spent several days there in sustained, consistent, constant prayer. Now, this is a rhetorical question. What's your prayer life like? What is your prayer life like? I ask you this question, too. What's your Bible look like? But we'll get to that in a minute. We're going to focus in on prayer right now. They were gathered in prayer, specifically in this group, communal prayer, where the body of Christ gathered together for prayer. There was a significant part of the, of the story of Acts. They prayed. They were a praying church. One of the things you will definitely notice in the coming weeks is there's power when God's people gather together to pray. You know, we've done that this year. We had 40 days of prayer. We had a, a five-week fast, which led to times of prayer. You know, and one, one thing, I, and I'm going to beat this up a little bit, okay? And probably this comes from some of, some, some of what I may have said. We got focused too much, I think, during our fasting time on what we were giving up and not on our praying time. Because it's not about what you give up. It's about praying. And that's the focus. And that was, that's how the early church grew and multiplied and how God did amazing, powerful things was through the prayer of his people. I think prayer is, is, is paramount to anything and everything that we do. They gathered together. And we're going to see that in the coming weeks. We'll see it today. One thing they all had in common. What was that? This group had one thing in common. 
What was it? You look around in our church this morning. How many of you are native Idahoans? Wow, there's a whole lot more of us than I thought. Amen. You know, how many of us are, how many of you are, well, we won't ask. We won't go, we won't go there. We want to keep unity this morning. But we're all different ages. There's some men, there's some women, there's some kids. We have a lot of differences in, in, in line, don't we, really, if you think about it? But, but we have one thing that's constant. Our economic status, right? No, that's not it. Our stand in society. No, that's not it. Can't, it can't be our gender. It can't, even, it can't be our ethnic background. Well, what's the lowest common denominator that we have? An allegiance and a transformed life in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what binds us together, guys, is Jesus Christ and his power, that he lives inside of us, that he guides us, he leads us, that we are his children. That's what binds us together. The foundation, and that's the foundation on which this early church built their momentum in the book of Acts. They had unity in Jesus and unity together. It wasn't like a unity in sports. That, no, it was a supernatural unity that comes together. Look, when we talk about unity, that doesn't mean that every one of us here has to agree to the, exactly the same thing. That's okay. How many of you are Pittsburgh Steelers fans? You've got like a couple more people with you, you know? Okay. You know, but we can go on. You, you probably have a different team. But yet, you can come together here, and, and we can be brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe your eschatology is different than mine, or maybe you use a different translation of the Bible. But can't we come together as brothers and sisters? There's some things that, you know, we don't need to fight over them. We can discuss them. We can debate them in love. But we come together with this unity because we're, we are the body of Pierce Park Baptist Church. God has put us together, and we have the unity of that. The unity that can be cultivated through prayer and through worship as gathering together. Romans 15, 16 says this. Make the God of endurance and encouragement, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you agreement with one another according to Jesus Christ, so that you may glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with the united mind and voice. It doesn't mean that we are carbon copies, but that we come together. How would, that, how would it be if people were saying, man, Pierce Park Baptist Church, man, that's a church, those people are together. Man, those people have some unity. They are of one mind and one body. That would be an awesome thing. Hopefully, hopefully that's what people say about us. Hopefully that's what we say about us. You know, as we think about it. Glorify God. We glorify God and the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, it'd be a great day when churches across the world have this unity, this supernatural unity. But I'm afraid not all churches get along, unfortunately. Adrian Rogers said this, We've been wired together by organization, frozen together by formalism, rusted together by tradition, and it's time that we become melted together through prayer. That's exactly what the prelude to victory for you and for our church will be, is prayer. Gathered together in a unified body. Not only were they prayer, was their prayer a prelude to, to, victory, to unity, but to victory. So many times you see them praying as we're going to look through the book of Acts. Every mighty work of God, someone somewhere has paid the price in prayer. In prayer. Bill McLeod, a pastor from Canada, a generation ago he was pastoring a church in Canada. There was a tremendous revival that swept across large portions of the nation, and it originated in Pastor Bill's church. You know how it started? God came to Pastor Bill one day and said, Bill, I'm going to spend, send revival when your Wednesday night prayer meeting exceeds capacity on your Sunday morning service. Guess what he led the church to do? To pray. To pray. To pray. Guess what I'm going to lead you to do? starting this Wednesday night. Dinner starts at 5.15. You want to show up at 4.30, we're going to be in here praying. If you don't want to come, that's fine. But anywhere between 4.30 and 5.15, I'm going to be in here praying. I invite you. Let's pray. Let's see what God can do as we gather together and start to pray. Amen? By the way, 
In the history of revivals, every one of them starts with people gathering together in prayer through the power of, of God working through the prayer of his people. They gathered together in prayer. Number two, they were grounded in the word of God. Look at Acts 15 through 20. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120 and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scriptures be fulfilled with the Holy, that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David foretold about Judas, who would become a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Verse 17. For he was one of our numbers and shared in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wage. He fell head first. His body burst open. His intestines spilled out. Kind of gross, isn't it? Yeah. That came, this became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that, the, so that in their own language the field is called, I can't pronounce it, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in it and let someone take his position. Remember, Judas is the one that betrayed Jesus. And because of that, we know what happened to the Lord Jesus. And so, the Word of God. I asked you a minute ago, what's your prayer life look like? I'm going to ask you right now. I said, what's your Bible look like? Is it, is it, is it marked up? I know there are some of you probably that it's like, well, you can't mark in the Bible. I used to be one of those. I remember when I first got saved, and my wife and I were sitting there at church, and, and she's like coloring and highlighting, and it's like, what are you doing? You can't write in the book of God. She goes, yeah, it's, it's for me. And so now I, I, I highlight it. I encourage you to highlight your book. My, my question basically is, is your, highlight, is your book highlighted up? Is your Bible falling apart? Because usually if your Bible's falling apart, your life isn't. It, I mean, you know why it isn't? Because you spend time in it. If your life's falling apart, you probably haven't been spending time in the Word of God. You know, we gather in prayer, we, we, we trust, we, we really focus in on the Word of God. They spent time together in prayer. Peter stood up and he addressed the elephant in the room. He asked the question that everybody else wanted to do, but nobody would. What about Judas? A perplexing question, if you think about it. You say, why is that a perplexing question? Well, I want you to think of just for a moment the mindset of the disciples at this point. You know, it's not really spelled out, but, it, but it's kind of, yeah, I think it's clear. First off, they were perplexed about God's plan. Remember back over in Acts chapter 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, the disciples came to Jesus right before he ascended, and they said, Lord, at this time will you restore the kingdom? You know, they were looking for the kingdom, you know, they were looking for Jerusalem to be back like it used to be. You know, maybe, maybe it was a, a red baseball cap, you know, make Israel great again. I don't know. But they wanted to, to be back to where this, they were the kingdom. They didn't have the Romans in town. The Romans couldn't tell them what to do. And that's what the question they're asking. Was that what Jesus had been preaching to them all the time? Had he been teaching and, and, and showing them? No, that's not it. They wanted to restore, <coughs> excuse me. They wanted the, the, the earthly kingdom of, Jerusalem, of, of, of Israel restored. Jesus said, I didn't come to do that. Go back to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit. So what about Judas? Not only was their, they were perplexed about God's plan, they were perplexed about their partner Judas. Remember, we've had 21 century, or we're in the 21st century, we've had a couple thousand years to see and understand. I believe they thought Judas was, was like, man, he was going to be the high-end achiever. He was like the class Victorian. You might sit there and go, how can that be? Well, remember, we have a lot more information than they did. You know how? They made him treasurer. You don't just give some guy this, oh, he's going to betray you. He's going to be the, he's going to be the weak link. No, they thought he was high. They, they were high on him. And then they made him treasurer. And look what he did. He turned into be a scoundrel, didn't he? I don't, you know, you remember when Jesus is with his disciples, one of you is going to betray me. Didn't hear anybody piping up, it's going to be Judas. It's going to be him. No, they were saying, is it me? Is it me? Because I think they thought Judas was like, he was the up and comer. So they're perplexed about God's plan. They're perplexed about their partner that was with him who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter stood up and gave him a word, and his, his word was ground in the word of God. 
Brothers, the scripture has been fulfilled that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David spoke in advance about Jesus, Judas. This wasn't a surprise. It's written in the book of Psalms. Let his dwelling place become isolate, de- desolate. You can, this is kind of paraphrased. Hey guys, David predicted a thousand years ago. Why should we be surprised? God wasn't surprised. The bottom line is for the early church, scripture defined reality. Does scripture define your reality? Ultimately, it's the word of God. The scripture de- defines reality. I'm going to encourage you. Base your life, ground your life on the word of God. If we build on the word of God, man, we're going to maintain. Look, quick, quick quote or quick rabbit chase. If you build your life on the word of God, you're still going to have issues. You're still going to have trouble, tribulations. It's coming. But you build your life on that book, and you're going to get through it. You will get through it. As we move forward as a body, we're not in in any less of a perplexing circumstance or chaotic times in the early church. The world has unplugged from the truth that God has revealed to us. As Dr. Phil would say, how's that working out for you? It ain't. Our world is filled with chaos. You look around, you think about it. Our politicians are liars. You know how you know they're lying? Their lips are moving. I mean, they play both sides. It's crazy. You know, we, are, we, we don't know if we're, we live in a day, in a society today, we don't know if we're a man or a woman, or if we were laid as a chair. We kill babies on demand. We call it choice. Our morals have, you know, they've decayed. We're, we're fall- Guys, our world is falling apart. But I'm telling you what, the early church was ground in the scriptures. If you and I decide we're going to be ground in the scriptures, we're going to be called narrow-minded hate mongers, white bigots, or whatever color you are, bigot, because you're a Christian. You know what? I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. If you have an issue with, with my beliefs, because I, I, I ground my, word, my, my beliefs in the word of God, then you have a problem with God. That's a big problem for you. I'm telling you, the early church was grounded in the scriptures. We would do well to do the same thing. Number three, they focused on the purpose that they were given. If you will, they were gripped by this purpose that Jesus had given them. Acts chapter 1, verse 21 to 26. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time that the Lord Jesus went in and among us, Beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph and Justice and and Matthias. Then they prayed, you Lord know everybody's heart. They chose Matthias. We never hear anything of him again. God raised up another witness, didn't he? You think about the Apostle Paul. God raised him up. But you think about it. We don't really end up seeing a lot of what, what the disciples did. You, we get to heaven. I'm going to go looking up some disciples. I want to know what life was like here for them after the ascension, after they started preaching the gospel. I want to, go, I, I want to visit with them. And you, you know the great thing of it is? We've got all of eternity to visit with brothers and sisters in Christ. But who knows? Maybe we get there, we know it all. Some of us think we know it all now, so who knows. In the middle of all this, they began to focus on their purpose that Jesus had called them to. They began to focus on what God had commanded them to do. There's a lot uh, of perplexity in their minds, but one thing they knew for certain. Jesus had told them, you will be my witness. You will be my witness. They said, we need, to, we need to fill out the ranks because that's what the Bible said. Judas is gone. We're down one. We're going to get Matthias. And we're going to be about witnessing. We're going to be about doing what God has said. They were fixated on the purpose that Jesus had left them. They were absolutely, if you will, gripped by it. It was their focus. Have you ever heard the term soul winner? It's probably not a word that we really hear that much anymore. But, you know. but a soul winner is... It's, it's, it's biblical. It's in Proverbs chapter 11, 30. It says, he who wins souls is wise. A soul winner is absolutely gripped by the purpose of Jesus Christ for his or her life. They truly believe in, in, in it they, when it says witness. 
I've seen examples of soul winners. I've known some soul winners. And I'm telling you what, it's just who they are. They can't help but share Jesus. It's like they speak Jesus, and it's like the, the Word of God oozes out of them. And they're infectious to other people. Does that describe you? Does that describe us? Hopefully it is. Hopefully, you know, it's like, man, do we have a burden to tell people about Jesus? Are we focused on the purpose that God give us, gave us? See, God didn't leave us here to have fellowship. Fellowship is fantastic. God could have, God could have we, could, we could accept Jesus Christ, pass away and be in the presence of heaven. We'll know everything that we need to. But God left us here for a reason and a purpose. And it's to witness. I think as a church, we get confused about witnesses. You know, it seems to me that sometimes, you know, we, we think we need to be a, a lawyer for God. We'll get there in a minute. We think about it. Pastor and former SBC leader Bobby Welch said this, one of my concerns for the church today is that being a witness is just one of the many things that we do. We've got a lot of programs. We've got this, we've got that. And it's very easy for people to say, you know, that witnessing thing, that's not really my deal. Some of you may be sitting there going, that witnessing thing is not my deal. I mean, I sing in the, I sing in the, in the worship team, that's my deal. Or I volunteer in the nursery, man, that's my deal. Or I play on the church softball team, we don't have one, that can't be your deal. But that's, that's my ministry, you know. This witnessing, that, that's not, not really about me we got to be careful. We can get so busy doing so many good things, we miss the greatest thing. And we talked about a witness. And again, I think sometimes we get this mixed up between being a witness and a lawyer. You know the difference, right? You know, a lot of times the impression is that, that we need to coerce people into Jesus. We need to beat them over the head, if you will. Somehow, you know, it's like, that, because that's what a lawyer seems to be. It's like, you know, they are there to, they are there to, to influence the jury for their client. You know, and they're going to do whatever they can. They'll attack the prosecutor. And you just think about a, a lawyer. <clears throat> a witness, we tell what we've seen. We tell what the Lord has done. You know, a lawyer is kind of like you stand outside Walmart and you grab a guy, he's going in, you need Jesus. That may not work out for you. If you, get, if you get thrown in jail, give me a call. Pastor J.W., I'll come see you. you know. that's, that's not what this is about. And I've told you this. I remember when I first got saved, man, I was on fire for Jesus. I've come to the point that the Lord has, has forgiven me of my sins, and now I'm going to tell everybody about him. I'd walk up to people, you know Jesus, because if you don't, you're going to hell. You know how many people I won to Christ? You need to change that approach temperate. And that's what God did in my life. But as a witness, I guess the challenge in some churches is there's a lot of people who haven't seen or heard anything from Jesus. They can tell you what it was when they got saved, and that was 20 years ago, but they can't tell you what God's doing right now because they're not walking that close with him. I want to be compassionate as I say this. If you don't know that there is a specific time in your life when you gave your life to Christ, you may not have it either. If you have never personally received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this morning I want to encourage you to do just that. You may be coming to church all your life. Doesn't get you into heaven. You may give thousands and thousands of dollars. Doesn't matter. Doesn't get you into heaven. You may serve in many ministries. Doesn't matter. It doesn't get you to heaven. There's one way and one way only. And if you have not done that, if you, if you have a doubt, call upon the name of the Lord. You shall be saved. We're sinners. The wages of sin is death. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Simply call out, God, I need you. That leads us to the next steps. The first one is maybe today you realize you need Jesus. 
I encourage you to figure that out right now. How would you rate your prayer life? The next step, how would you rate your prayer life? Well, Pastor Bill, I struggle to pray. Why? You're talking to God. Some of you I know can talk, because y'all talk my ear off at times, you know. Like right before Sunday morning church, have you ever noticed, and I'm, 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 be, I'm, I'm joking, okay, but a lot of you want to talk right before I'm headed up here. I love you, let's visit after church. How's your time in the Word of God? Maybe your life isn't changed and lining up with God because you don't know what you're lining up to. And we can't be, I think it was like Thomas Jefferson. His Bible, he took through and, 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 and cut out the verses that he didn't like. We can't do that. Sounds goofy, doesn't it? Hey, there's some stuff in there that I'm like, man, God, you're meddling in my life. But the reality of it is in there because God says it needs to be there. So how's your, how's your time in the Word of God? Go ye therefore and make disciples. Go ye therefore. That's what it says in Matthew 28. Go. So, and really that translates out, as you go through life, speak Jesus. Be speaking Jesus wherever you go. You're not a lawyer. We're a witness. So, yeah, but Pastor Bill, some people look at me and say, just shut up, I don't want to hear about Jesus. You know what? Okay. Just keep on trucking down the road to the next person. One of the things, one of the keys, and it's, we're talking about it this morning, one of the keys is that we gather together for prayer, that we pray for those who don't know Jesus. We pray for their hearts. We pray for their lives. We pray that their spiritual eyes are open, their heart is open. I've shared about my dad, my mom and dad. Man, we prayed and prayed and prayed. I'm not sure, but I know my dad's heart changed and softened through those years. I had a pastor friend of mine who's now with the Lord, but he prayed for, for one of his cousins for like 40 plus years. And his guy got saved. How many of us pray that long? You know, it's like somebody's like, man, if I pray 40 seconds, Pastor Bill. And I, look, I'm not here, guys, I'm not here to beat us up. That's not what this is about. But are we praying for the unsaved? Are we willing to go? Are we ready, as Peter says, to give an answer for the hope that we have? We may stumble through it. We may, we may botch it. But you know what? We have a God who's awesome. And the Holy Spirit, when you're sitting there, when, you, when, you're, when you're sharing about Jesus, when you're witnessing about Jesus, you're not doing it alone. The Holy Spirit of God is with you. And the Holy Spirit of God is, is talking to that person. And all of a sudden, you, they, you maybe sound like some great theologian to them. It's all God. I know there's stories of people that's like, man, you, you, you've witnessed, I've heard you say it, and afterwards you're going, I didn't know I knew all that. You study, you spend time in the Word of God, God pulls it out when He needs it. Amen? Again, Wednesday night, we start a, we're going to start a prayer time. I invite you to be here, 4.30. Spend time in prayer. Maybe you don't want to come pray in, in public. You know what? That's okay. Spend time in the Word of God. And be ready. To take the gospel momentum forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your Word.